Wagwan, my loves. I'm back for another video. <laughs> I did three earlier and I finished my research about the one I said I wanted to, to share with you guys about Jupiter. So that's what this video is going to be about. The actual title is um, different, a different perspective on Jupiter and the Son of God. And um, of course, I always want to send you guys out peace, blessing, blessings, love, and abundance before I get started on the video. Um, now, even though this is not a soul food for thought, this will be a lengthy video. I typed up 17 pages of research and, uh, <laughs> yes, 17 pages of research. So it'll either be broken up into two or three different segments. I won't let it run all the way through because I know it's going to take some time. And I have a tendency to add a little something, something as it comes to me. My higher self, you know, gives me information to share with you guys. So I definitely want to make sure that um, I, I I tell you guys to please, please, please keep an keep an open mind and be open to other perspectives. Remember that um, you should never, ever, ever think that you know everything, and you should always be open because we know that we're living in this physical realm, and so things have been changed and things have been kind of hidden from us. So this is age of um, going into age of Aquarius, which is the age of knowledge. And so we're learning a lot of things or we're recalling a lot of things. So I just want to give you guys a different perspective on it and another way to look at the planet Jupiter. Since we already know that Saturn is the time that we've been dealing and living, um, living in and dealing with um, in the age of Pisces, you know, even though the, the uh, Pisces symbol is the fish. And so Jesus is symbolized by the fish. We do know that the Saturn, Saturnian energy uh, has been playing, um, been utilized to keep us limited, you know. So that's why I want you to definitely um, keep an open mind when it comes to this information that I'm about to deliver to you. And do not think I'm just giving this information because my um, son is in Sagittarius, which is ruled by or governed by Jupiter. Um, that I'm pretty sure plays a part in it because, you know, you get different signals and things like that. So that could definitely be a reason being, but it's not the reason why I, uh, I feel that this could actually have a lot of truth behind it. And if I didn't feel it didn't have some type of truth behind it, I wouldn't share it with you guys. So, um, hey Slater. Little cute kitty came in here and he Slater, he won't come on, hold on. I'm gonna switch I'm gonna switch to the bouncy ball and give him the little chair because he wants to be down here with me. There you go. He wants to be down here with me. Excuse me. I hope I didn't show anything. But um yeah, he wants to be down here with me and so that's fine. I haven't sat on the bouncy ball all day and it is comfortable and yeah, so I'm good. All right. Oh, thanks for coming, Slater. I think he wants to hear this information, too. So, let's go ahead and jump into it, y'all. Are y'all excited? I am. <laughs> All right. So, again, it's a different perspective on Jupiter and the Son of God. So, let's talk about our solar system. Starting off, we know that Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system, as far as we know. All right? Now, uh... It is called, actually, the sun of the sun. And when I say sun, it's S-O-N of the sun. And um, it has been known and been called that since the most ancient of times to astrologers. I feel like I need to burp. And that one came out. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me, guys. I will not be editing you, okay? Excuse me. Now, it is on average the third brightest object in the night sky after the moon and Venus. All right? So Jupiter actually is brighter than Venus at some times in the night sky, even though the, um, I went ahead and put that information down. I did um, do research and see that j there are times that Jupiter is brighter than Venus. And I actually talk about that later on in this, uh, in my 17 page uh, document. Okay. So that means that it is visible to the naked eye in the night sky and can occasionally be seen in the daytime when the sun is low. Now, um, what by um, meaning that the, that the sun is low, like meaning like in dawn when uh, at dawn before the sun fully rises, Jupiter is actually pretty bright at certain times of the year as well. All right. Now, Jupiter actually rests. If you didn't know, 
Jupiter rests in the center of the orbital line of planets with four planets preceding it, all right? And there are four planets that, um, excuse me, and there are four planets that extend past it. So the four planets that uh, precede it from the sun, this is starting from the sun, is Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Those are the four planets that precede it. Now, the four planets that extend past it are Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. So it's dead in the center, all right? And I don't mean the word dead, but it's literally in the center, all right, of our solar system, of the planetary bodies. Now, this position um, of balance actually makes the energy of Jupiter ideal for justice because it's balance, manifestation, and perfect order. Think about that. When you think about Libra and you think about the scales, balancing it, right? You know that you have to be balanced, balanced on both sides. Well, Jupiter actually is balanced on both sides. Not only is it balanced on both sides because it has four planets in front of it and four planets behind it, it also is the biggest planet, right? <laughs> when you talk about the actual size of it, okay? Even though we know that it's um, denser than Earth because it's not solid, all right? And I'm going to get into that too. So uh, now we're going to talk about what our sun is made of. All right, we're going to have a little science lesson. The sun is a huge glowing spear of hot gas, all right? Most of this gas is hydrogen, which is about 70%, and helium, about 28%. Then it also has carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen made up of 1.5%, and the other 0.5% is made up of small amounts of many other elements, such as neon, iron, silicon, magnesium, and sulfur. Just like, you know, when you think about this human body, this vessel, and then also when you think about the fact that we're all energy, that means that we are made up of that same, you know, same elements. We're all made up of everything. So now let's move up to what Jupiter is made of. Jupiter actually, let's start with the fact that Jupiter was actually born early in the solar system's, his, solar system's history. It is thought that Jupiter was the first planet in our solar system. All right. So, um... It's actually um, formed from the same cloud of gas and dust that formed the sun. Jupiter is mostly made out of hydrogen and helium, just like the sun, all right? With, like I said, it's the same light gases as the sun. The rest of Jupiter includes water, ammonia, and methane, which are compounds that arise when you mix oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon in a hydrogen-rich atmosphere. So because Jupiter is hydrogen-rich, it actually changes the compounds of um, the oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon to water, ammonia, and methane. And when you think about hydrogen and oxygen, you think about how that creates water. And just think about how the, um, the periodic table works. And when you mix certain um, elements together, how they create a new element. All right? Now, Jupiter is sometimes called a failed star because if, we, if it were about 80 times more massive, the pressure and temperature at the center will be high enough for nuclear fusion to ignite and the planet will become a star, all right? The internal pressure and temperature necessary to cause hydrogen to fuse with helium, the energy source that powers the sun and most other stars, all right? That's cool as fuck, right? That's, that's really cool. That's dope. So now, Jupiter is also a protector of the Earth, so we're going to get into that. Just some fun facts about Jupiter. Jupiter is also the protector of the Earth. It has been called the shepherd because it prevents asteroids from colliding with Earth. Jupiter also prevents comets and other planetary um, rock from becoming new planets due to its magnetism, due, due to its strong pull. It literally um, pulls them and it actually flings them, like literally, you know, flings them sometimes out of, you know, our solar system. That's cool as well. Jupiter's magnetic field pulls the potential planets closer to its surface. That's why um, we're going to get into this next fact. So due to this fact, Jupiter has the most moons of any other planet in the solar system. The count is thought to be between 67. Last count I saw was 79 moons. That's a lot of fucking moons. Jupiter has more planetary bodies orbiting it than the sun. It's basically Jupiter's own galaxy inside a galaxy. And some other things I read, which I didn't put down here, I just want to add to it, is that uh, in the scientists doing research and everything um, into other galaxies, they saw that mo a lot of galaxies that, that are closer to us are compact. They have a lot of um, what they call super Earths. 
or um, bigger planetary um, bodies that are orbiting their suns and they're mostly gaseous planets. They're not planets that could actually inhabit the type of life that we have, or that we know on this particular plane, on this planet. So because of Jupiter, because of Jupiter being the barrier and just, you know, basically being like the, what do they call it in basketball when they, um, the, is it the point guard? When he'd be like, you know, hitting the ball, like get that shit out of here type of thing. That's Jupiter playing that defense. You know what I'm saying? Saying you're not, uh, you're not coming into this, to the solar system. And if you really think about it, there is a big gap between Mars and Jupiter, a big gap between Mars and Jupiter. And there's actually an asteroid belt, uh, which is, um, pretty much thought to be, um, remnants of, of, of another planet. And they actually talked about in ancient times, how earth was created from two planets that collided. And it's thought that Jupiter actually had some type of, um, um, some type of, what word am I trying to say, guys? Goodness. Impact on that. You know, that it, that it might have been the cause of that effect of those becoming an asteroid belt and no longer being an asteroid. And as well as we also know that Jupiter also has rings just like Saturn. So just think about that fact. Jupiter and Saturn both have their own rings. It's just that Saturn's rings are, are more visible. Than, than Jupiter's. However, the first ring that goes around Jupiter, that first layer of rings, is actually called its halo. Think about that. Now, so um, the strange wing, uh, winds um, that um, are actually on Jupiter, or the strong winds that are on Jupiter, they make the knitted appearance between the adjacent bands of the storms on Jupiter. Hence, it was that the ancients wrote while identifying Jupiter as Osiris the king. All right? They said, O oh, Osiris the king, the gods have knit together your face for you. Okay. Now let's talk about Jupiter, Venus, and the sun. Venus is not the only morning star, which I said, you know, earlier that you could see Jupiter in the, in the um, dawn sometimes during the a.m. So it's not the only morning star in our galaxy. Not many people are aware of the fact that the planet Jupiter, which in Latin was called, um, I think it was pronounced, um, um, I don't want to pronounce it wrong, but I think it was, uh, Upiter, Upiter, like, yeah, Upiter, but it's spelled I-U-P-P-I-T-E-R or I-U-P-I-T-E-R. Um, that Jupiter is also called the morning star and is most likely the morning star that is spoken of in the Bible, which means that Venus is not the true morning star of mythology, if that's the case. And when the Bible says that there um, fell a great star from heaven, they are referring to Jupiter, who is also known as Jove, J-O-V-E. Now, if you don't know who Jove is, Jove um, is the Roman god who is also called Jupiter. Okay? Jove is the older name the Romans had for the god Jupiter, which derives from an alteration of Jovis Pat Pater or Pater, which is spelled J-O-V-I-S. Pater is spelled P-A-T-E-R, which means Father Jove. All right? Jupiter was the Roman god of the sky, the king of the gods, gods meaning planets at that time, the sovereign deity who had powers over both gods and men. Jupiter is also the chief Roman god, husband of Juno, and god of light, um, and god of light of the sky and weather, and of the state and its welfare and its laws. So you can compare that to Greek Zeus. And even though I know that the Greeks and the Romans plagiarized, I'm just giving you this information because I'm also going to get into the ancient Egyptians, Sumerians, slash Babylonian stuff. I'm going to get into that too, okay? Now, in Latin, I'm going to give you a, a modern, a, a, a more modern name, Jovan, J-O-V-A-N or jo Jovan, however you want to pronounce it. We pronounce it mainly Jovan. However, however um, it is a Latin baby name. Okay, and in Latin, the meaning of Jovan is father of the sky. All right, so the ancient civilizations in Jupiter. So this is where I'm going to start to get uh, more into uh, how the ancients saw Jupiter. Ancient astrologers have always associated Jupiter with the birth of kings and Venus with fertility. However, Jupiter was also associated with fertility as well. So Jupiter was not only associated as being um, the birther of kings, but also associated with fertility, okay? 
This is why Jupiter is called in ancient mythology the king planet, father of the sky, father of the gods, and lord of heaven. Okay, this fact is also is, I don't know why I keep saying okay. I just <laughs> Maybe because I want to make sure that you guys don't be like, what the hell is she talking about? Just let you say, okay, I'm just giving you information. Now, uh, this fact is important in understanding that the planet Jupiter for thousands of years has always been associated with the birth of kings. And it is the start in the Bible of the Magi and star of Bethlehem. In Sumerian text, Jupiter is called Malu Babur, and that's M-U-L-U-B-A-B-B-E-R, which actually means bright sun-like star. And it's also called Nibiru, or Nebiru, which simply means ferry boat or to cross or place of transition. All right? Now, in Babylonian slash Assyrian um, um, culture, the star of Babylon is detailed in inscriptions as the star of Murdoch, I think, I think is how it's pronounced. That's M-A-R-D-U-K. I'm spelling things so you can do your own research and you can just see, you know, this information that I'm, I'm talking about, okay? So, uh, Murdoch is also called Jupiter. As the planet Jupiter does every year, it crosses the winter solstice in a ferry boat-like manner in which the gods of Osiris and Murdoch had died only to be resurrected Representing continu con um, representing stability and continuity. Is that, did I pronounce that right? Ba basically meaning continuing or continuous words sometimes, I swear. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to note about Jupiter's moons that I didn't bring up because I didn't put it in here. Jupiter's moons, some of them actually uh, go, are, go retro are, are retrograde. Like, that's their normal cycle is to be retrograde while others are go the normal cycle. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Now, getting back to this. When the stars of Enlil have been finished, one big star, although its light is dim, divides the sky in half and stands there. What did I say earlier? Jupiter is in between. It's in the middle. It balance, perfect balance between the four planets before it and the four planets after it. Okay? That is the star of, um, it looks like they pronounce it different, but I'll say Marduk, Marduk, um, Nebiru, or Nebiru, Ju or Jupiter. It keeps changing its position and, and crosses the sky. Jupiter is also symbolized in Egyptian mythology as uh, Osiris or Asar, who is the god of water and heaven. And also after the Roman conquest of Egypt by Augustus Caesar, where Osiris has morphed into the god Jupiter um, Ammon, A-M-M-O-N. Uh, Osiris is the later Egyptian successor to the Babylonian god Merodach, I think it's Merodach, um, whose original character is also connected with water, vegetation, judgment, and magic. There are some um, ancients who said that Jupiter is the reason that the earth has water. That because of the Jupiter actually threw the ingredients that Earth needed in order to create that the type of structure that she is and the atmosphere that she needed in order to for the type of life that's on this planet to exist. <clears throat> now we're going to get into the Egyptian Amun Ra, the Amen. All right, A M U N Ra, and it's the 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 Amun is actually of course spelled different ways, but. Uh, A-M-U-N is the one that I normally use. Now, what does Amun Ra actually mean? Amun means hidden, and Ra means light, hidden light. Hmm. Might sound like Jupiter, okay? And I'm actually going to get into that now. So, therefore, Amun Ra means hidden light. Amun Ra was considered the god of kings and the king of gods. Jupiter actually emits its own infrared light. Jupiter gives off twice as much energy as it receives from the sun. Twice as much energy as it actually receives from the sun. The second planet that actually gives off almost twice the energy that it receives from the sun is Saturn. Think about that. Think about that. Okay. Now let's get into the winged disc. The winged disc. So... We know that in Egyptian culture and also Mesopotamian culture, the winged disc is a common symbol for many ancient civilizations. 
they actually the symbol um has a circular disc and then it has wings right so this symbol has been found in the records of ancient cultures residing in various regions of South America as well as Australia. Of course, not just in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. And we know that there were ancient melanated cultures that were all over the world, okay? Now, while this symbol is normally associated with the sun, a closer look at the ancient wall images, why did I have close on hand twice? A closer look at the ancient wall images uh, Sumerian seals and free Mason actually free Masonic symbolism reveal a different interpretation. In the earliest depictions of the winged disc found in Mesopotamia, we find it surrounded by three other celestial objects. One is a star-like object with rays representing the sun. Okay, so we have the sun. The second thing you see is either a crescent or a full moon, which is surrounded by seven stars, representing Pleiades star cluster, also known as the seven sisters. Then you have the winged disc being the central and most important symbol. Okay? This must mean it represents a different celestial object because you already have the sun represented with the rays. Okay, let me go further. The sun-shaped disc on the deity's, deity's heads is the, um, this isn't, I'm speaking of ancient Egypt right now. The sun-shaped disc on the deity's heads is the color orange, not yellow. Orange is more similar to the color of Jupiter, don't you think? Jupiter is associated also with the eagle by the cultures that plagiarized the Egyptians, um, or the ancient, or, or the ancient, ancient, or the, um, ancient, um, Sumerians, right? Um, however, in Egypt, Amun-Ra is associated with a falcon. So, even though those are two different birds, I still want you to just keep in mind that they both symbolize very strong birds. And um, I'm going to get into the eagle a little bit more so you can see why that particular bird might have been, could have just been changed so that you didn't make the connection between Egypt and um, the, the plagiarizers of the Egyptian and Sumerian cultures. That could be possibly why it's no longer a falcon, okay? Now, the wings on the symbol of the winged disc would then make sense that it represents Jupiter because Jupiter's symbol um, is an eagle. And in ancient um, Egypt, they had a falcon that rep represented Amon Ra, so it's still a bird with strong wings. So if you have a bird with strong wings, and then you have this orange disc that represents Jupiter. Let's think about that. Now let's talk about the all-seeing eye and how that connects to Jupiter. So uh, this is actually a quote from a man named Thomas Milton Stewart. It says, the inset before the Egyptian neophyte was illumination. That is to be brought to light. The religion of Egypt was a religion of light. Even though, you know, I don't really look at it as a religion. I look at it just, I look at it as what they saw it as, illumination, illuminating yourselves. You know, illuminating your first or your eye or your third eye, whatever you want to call it. In ancient Egypt, Osiris was the soul below God, and we know him as um, Asar as well. He was the soul below God who represented the as above planet of light, truth, and life, Jupiter. Horus, or Haru, was the soul below son of Osiris, an heir to the throne of the world. But unfor unfortunately for um, Horus, he had many adversaries on the soul below who happened to be members of his own family and that had wished to rule the world and take the throne from Osiris, a.k.a. Jupiter. One of these deities on the soul below was a god named Set. He was a god who represented the dark, the dark ringed planet on the as above that we know of today as Saturn or Satan. In ancient, in ancient Egypt, when Set or Saturn and Haru were fighting for the throne after Osar, Osar's death, Set gouged out Haru's left eye. The eye was restored by, in some stories they say Hathar, in some stories they, they say um, um, Thoth, which or Toth, I think it's Thoth, which is Mercury. Um, however, when um, Haru recovered his eye, he offered it to his father, Asar or Osiris, in hopes of restoring his life. Hence, the eye of Haru was often used to symbolize sacrifice, healing, restoration, and protection. And... 
I'm going to keep going and then I'm going to explain to you how this to me ties into Jupiter. Now, Albert Mackey writes that the all seeing eye is an important symbol of the supreme being borrowed by the Freemasons from the nations of antiquity. Jupiter as Lord of the world and God by law is verified in an official treaty written in stone between Ramses the um, II and ha and Hattasili the third of Hattie, the um, I think it's Hittite chief, where they refer to Jupiter as the Lord of the heaven. This is where the phrase as above so below is derived and how some governments rule over their people. The reason that Egyptians had represented Asar and Haru with, with the all-seeing eye is because their planet Jupiter also has a giant all-seeing eye. Okay, The mythologies of both the ancient Egyptians and Greeks throughout history tell of the spiritual and heavenly battles of the as above so below that governs the souls on earth. The battle between Jupiter and Saturn. Okay. So, um, Proclus gives us the following as one of the verses of Orpheus. Jupiter is the king. Jupiter himself is the original source of all things. There is one power, one God, and one great ruler over all. But we have seen that Jupiter and all the other gods were but names for the sun. Therefore, it follows that the sun, either as emblem or as God himself was the object of universal adoration. Now, we're gonna get into Jupiter, the morning star, and then I think I'm gonna go to video number two. So, Jupiter, the morning star. I already talked about earlier how Jupiter is, uh, can be seen in the, the morning, just like you can see Venus uh, most of the time, and sometimes it's brighter than Venus. All right, so now, let's get into the Bible a little. Jupiter is not only the king, planet, and lord of heaven and the as above, it is also the morning star, blazing star, and the star of Bethlehem of the Bible. The brightness of this morning star can be, the, can be best seen in December and January, right around when we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, who in the King James Bible, what Jesus and Lucifer are called the morning star. For example, we see Jesus call himself the bright morning star in Revelation twenty two sixteen. I, Jesus, has, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And it is also applied to Lucifer, where we see the term appears in the context of an um, oracle against a dead king of Babylon, who is addressed um, as they have a name, Hillel ben Sahar. Rendered by the King James version, version as O Lucifer, son of the morning star, son of the morning, and by others as morning star, son of the dawn. Okay, <clears throat> and um, yeah. So just think about that. And another thing I thought I, I thought of when I was typing this is that you know you have Jup Jupiter and you have Lucifer. Jupiter, Lucifer. Just think about that. Okay, and then the reason why they gave Jesus a name Jesus, starting with a J, you know what I'm saying? Just think about that. They they gave him the us because of Horus, right? But the J E S part, kind of think of Jew, Jupiter, you know, or or J, you know. Just think about that. How that could be translated to mean Jupiter. Now, Greek mythology. The Greeks had named their greatest of all God Zeus, which also represents the as above of the planet Jupiter. The son of Zeus, Jupiter, Prometheus is the so below savior son. In Greek mythology, Prometheus is the Titan chiefly honored for stealing fire. Fire represents knowledge from the gods and the stalk of a fennel plant and giving it to the mortals for their use. In Ovid's Metamorphosis, Jupiter told Prometheus to make a new race of people in godlike image from clay and then call upon the winds to breathe life into them. The father of mankind in the sky, Zeus or Jupiter, had denied this new creation, race of men, the secret of fire or the secret of knowledge. And his son Prometheus, feeling sorry for his creations, stole fire from Olympus and took it to man. Like what happened to Jesus Christ, Prometheus was crucified for teaching man the secret hidden knowledge known only to the gods. He was crucifi crucified by the father Jupiter or Zeus, who nailed him to an upright beam of timber. 
to which were uh, to which were affixed extended arms of wood, and this cross was situated near the Caspian Straits. Note, the Chinese and Japanese refer to Jupiter as Wood Star. Also, the planet Jupiter kind of looks like wood if you if you take a look at it. It looks like um, a lot of times like when you get a which I actually have petrified wood. I just, I didn't bring it down here for whatever reason. When you get a stone that um, petrified wood, just think about how that actually resembles Jupiter. Think about that too, okay? Now, um, not only the Chinese, in Vedic astrology, Hindu, astrolo Hindu astrologers named the planet after Brihaspati, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Brahaspati, the religious teacher of the gods and often called it guru, which literally literally means the heavy one. In the English English language, Thursday is derived from Thor's day, which with Thor associated with the planet Jupiter in Germanic mythology. The Romans had named Jupiter, Jupiter, Y-E-U-P-E-T-E-R, or Pator, father, which means father, or the nominative, Dias, di, uh, which is D-Y-E-U-S, Pator, meaning O Father, Sky God, or O Father, Day God, Day God. And he was a ruler of the lower world. And when you think of the lower world, think of, think of Earth, okay? This is the lower realm. Now, hence this is where we get the same, the name St. Peter in Roman Catholicism, ca Catholicism, I always want to call it Catholicism because it's Catholic, it's Catholicism is how they pronounce it, English. And the Pope who is Supreme Pontiff sits on the chair of Peter, Jew Peter, which our Lord delivered, delivered to him the keys of heaven in a grand festival held at St. Peter's at Rome for, uh, for they await the prophetic return of the Lord or Lords. Also, Paul the Apostle says that Peter had the special charge of being apostle to the Jews. Jew, J-E-Y, Peter. Maybe Jew came from the word Jew Peter. Okay, so like Prometheus and Jesus, um, don't forget that the father of the planets, the son of the sun and Lord of, and Lord of Lords, St. Peter or Jupiter was crucified on the cross, but instead cru crucified upside down. So I'm going to stop right there on video number one because I'm about to head on to my uh, 10th page and I'm actually moving through them pretty quickly. So hopefully it'll only be two videos. So I normally, you know, um, I'm still going to thank you guys for our uh um, tuning in to this video and being open-minded and you know receiving this information and just thinking about it you know what I'm saying this is my perspective this is some information I found and it makes a whole lot of sense and I'm going to do a summary and a breakdown at the end of it as well so it might the breakdown summary might go into video number three so again I'm sending you guys out so much love into the ether and so much appreciation and thanks for watching this video for liking this video for subscribing to my channel Check me out on my Instagram, Knowledge Butterfly, and also on my Facebook, Knowledge Butterfly, at Empress Rockstar. So I'm going to go ahead and move to video number two. So tune into that for more information, my loves. Peace.